that is very important because as I told you last time, the management is different. STEMI is an emergency, you need to do something immediately. Whereas NSTEMI or non est elevation MI, you can slowly take your time and do all your routine stuff and then do it. Okay. So who all know to read ECG? Again, don't worry, I'm not going to give you ECG and ask you to read. Who is all? To some extent. Arrhythmia. Arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is well okay, right? MI is difficult. Okay. Arrhythmia. Simple yeah. MI can be straightforward and much we can identify. I quickly touch some arrhythmias also. <coughs> Again, these are all basics. I don't want to waste too much of time on her. I quickly go on the ECG. So, hey, this is probably you need to know. You when know, you see an ECG, you see this complex, isn't it? So, you have this P wave. Then you have the small deflection that's called as the Q wave. This is the R. And anything when the R becomes below the baseline, it is the S wave. And then you got this T wave. Okay. So this segment from the S wave up to the beginning of the T is called as the ST segment. So this is the most important thing you need to remember. Because this is the one which will go down during ischemia and will go up during an infarction. Okay, so you need to remember this. ST segment, this is what we are looking at. Just for you, if you're interested, see P wave usually reflects any atrial So this deflection is generated by the atrial contraction. Say if the atrium is enlarged, this P wave can be big. In pulmonary hypertension, you can get tall P waves and also. So P waves is mainly to, to identify the atrial contraction. It's a QRS that is the ventricular contraction. Okay, so any problem with the ventricle, say a ventricle that is weak, you won't get nice big R wave like this. You get only small. So you will once again this poor R wave progression will say normally in the ventricular release. In V1 the R wave will be small, V2 it gets bigger, V4 and V5, V6 it will be much taller. So that is called as the R wave progression. When it is all flat, it is also a feature of ischemia. So remember, not ST segment depression alone. This poor R wave progression of the ECG is also a feature of the scheme. Okay. So QRS reflects your ventricular contraction. And this ST up to here, this part, reflects the ventricular relaxation. Okay. So in other words, this we technically we call this as the depolarization and this is the repolarization of those. So if you don't want to remember that, remember P is atrial contraction, QRS is ventricular contraction, the remaining is ventricular relaxation. So once you know the basics, if you identify a pathology, you know where the problem is. Whether it's with the ventricular contraction or with the ventricular relaxation or the atrium and so on. So this is on the actual wave morphology. Okay? The other thing which was talking about arrhythmias. For arrhythmias, you need to know the intervals. <coughs> see this, that is the atrium contracts and then there is a small conduction delay and then the ventricular contracts, right? So this is called as a PR interval. Sometimes you might have seen the PR interval is prolonged. So when the, the PR interval is prolonged, that means from the atrium, it takes longer for the contraction to reach the ventricle. So then the problem is actually in the AV node, isn't it? From the atrium, there's a ventricle, there is AV node in the middle. When there's a problem in the AV node, once again, due to ischemia or, in, uh, or infarction, sometimes it can be due to electrolyte abnormalities, drugs and so on, this PR interval gets wider. When the AV node is severely damaged, uh, you know heart block, complete heart block, second degree heart block, then there may be a lost capture also. So for every P wave, you may not get a QRS. So you may have two P waves and then QRS and so on. So in other words, apart from the morphology, you need to look at the intervals also, okay? So PR interval is for AV conduction, okay? QR, this is the QRS interval, that is for the ventricular conduction. You get in left ventral branch block, right ventral branch block. So this gets wider in any ventral branch block. So this is for the ventricular contraction. And the QT interval is mainly for relaxation. You get it with drugs and hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, the QT interval can be um, prolonged. So if you understand what, what each part of the ECG denotes, you can in a way identify the pathology also. Okay? So, but I know it's a bit too much, but just remember the basics. P wave is atrium. 
QRS is the ventricular ST is the ventricular relaxation QR interval is for the AV conduction QRS is for ventricular conduction and QT is for the ventricular relaxation interval okay. so that's the basic you probably need to know it's easy to understand the main you know where to place the ECG leads and all those things I'm not going to talk to you Axis and other things I don't think is that important for you, right? Axis deviation, left axis deviation, right bundle branch blocks. <clears throat> so this is an ECG of a right bundle branch block. See, normally, you know, I showed the normal QRS ECG. You had a one single stroke, right? In right bundle branch block, you will see typically here, yeah, I mean, it's not a typical ECG. Actually, you'll get like a two strokes here, in particularly in D1. So you get a small R wave and another. That's called as R. S R pattern. Okay. So in other words, in right particular right bundle branch block, you remember in V1 you'll get like two R waves. Okay, you remember, remember normal ECG only have one R wave. So in right bundle branch block, you'll have two R waves in V1. And anything in V6 is usually opposite of V1. Remember that. On the ECG, whatever you see in V6, because it's in the opposite side, it's an opposite of V1. So because you get this RSR, you get a big S wave here. Remember, I told you in the ECG. When the R wave comes below the baseline, it becomes the S wave. So you get this deep S wave. In a normal ECG, I'll show you later, you won't see this S wave. Okay. So when you get this RSR or this double R waves in V1 and the S wave in V6, it's right on the branch. Okay. You don't need to understand the mechanism, just mug it up. RSR in V1, that is or M pattern V1, deep S wave in V6, right on the branch. Okay, in left ventral branch block is the other way around. Yeah, so in left bundle branch block, see all these bundle branch blocks, the QRS gets wider. Remember, I told you the QRS duration, right? So there is a problem in the contraction within the conduction within the ventricle. So the QRS gets wider. Okay, so here, unlike the right bundle, it reverses. You get a deep best in V1. Remember, right bundle, you get the double R. RSR and deeper. Here you can see the it's, you don't get a typical RSR, but you get something like an M. Can you see that? M pattern. So M pattern in V6, deep S wave in V1 is left one. Okay, as I said, if you don't understand the mechanism, just mug it up. Okay. M in V1, the deep S wave in V6 is right on the branch block. But it reverses M in V6 and deep S in V1 is left on the branch block. Okay. So you know the normal sinus rhythm. When do you say sinus rhythm? See, whenever you see a P wave before QRS, it's sinus rhythm. Okay. When it's not there, it's not sinus rhythm. It can be anything. It can be junctional rhythm, nodal rhythm, ventricular rhythm. It can be various things. So to call it as a sinus rhythm, so if you're doing a normal ECG, if you see a P wave, you know it's sinus rhythm. Okay. If it's not there, that is a problem. Obviously, fast heartbeat is tachycardia. Slow one is sinus bradycardia. Okay. So you know all that. AV block, I don't want to go to it too much of detail, but I'll just show you some ECG. So remember I told you the AV node is between the atrium and the ventricle, right? So when there is a block, the conduction from the atrium to the ventricle takes longer. So can you see the PR interval is prolonged. prolonged. Okay, so when the PR interval is prolonged, you call it as a first degree AV block. In the AV block, there are three types, okay? The first degree AV block is you have PRS widening, but still for every P wave there is a QRS. You can see there's a P wave, there's a QRS. Okay, so just prolonged PR into this first TV AV, AV block. Very significant cause of the inferior mind, the commonest cause. Beta blockers. You know, all these beta blockers, calcium antagonists, digoxin, everything blocks the AV, works on the AV node. So when you give too much of dosages, you get PR interval, prolonged PR. So actually the commonest cause of prolonged PR interval is drugs. Beta blockers. Okay. So this is nothing but fire. Otherwise, the ECG is complete, you know. So only abnormality is the prolongation of PR interval. What is the normal PR interval? Less than one. Okay. Remember, three to five small squares. Okay. Each small square is 40 milliseconds. So three to five. When it's more than five millisquares, so here, here you can see it's starting here. It's more than five, isn't it? It's almost nine small squares. So three to five small squares is the normal PR interval. Okay. PR interval. Okay, 
I don't want to show you. The, the, then there is a second degree heart block. The second degree heart block, you get this prolongation of PR, but not all P waves get conducted. Okay? So sometimes you can get two P waves. This is a difficult one, but actually you can see that there's a P wave hiding here on the T wave. See, this is the T wave. There's a P on top of that. So actually there are two P waves and a QRS. Okay? That is the second degree heart block, where you have two P waves, one QRS. Sometimes it can be 3 is to 1. You'll have a 3 P waves and a QRS. Or 4 is to 1. 4 P waves and a QRS. That is the second degree heart block. Okay. So here also the PR interval is prolonged, but not all P waves is conducted. So that is second degree heart block. But still there is some conduction. Okay. Maybe it's not every P wave, every beat. Every fourth or every third atrial beat gets conducted. This is the second degree heart block. Okay. Then the third degree heart block. The third degree heart block is none of the P waves get conducted. Okay? But if the P wave doesn't conduct, the ventricle doesn't do anything, patient will not survive, right? So the ventricle starts beating on its own. Okay, that's called as a ventricular rhythm. So you will see P wave going at a particular rate, and in, in between there will be some QRS coming in. Completely no, that's called an AV dissociation. So there is no correlation between P waves and QRS. If you map it out, P wave will be nicely regular. Suddenly you'll get a QRS, ventricular beat. Then you can another ventricle can come here, it can come anywhere. So that's called a AV dissociation. So the atrium and the ventricle, there is no association between the atrium and the ventricle. So that is complete heart block. Okay? Sometimes it will be difficult to distinguish a second degree from a complete heart block. But remember, in second degree heart block, there is AV association. Still, some atrial beat is conducted. Okay. So how would you distinguish this if you see this air trip? Say this is like, I mean, this can be a four or five to one heart block also. There is one, two, three, four, five, and a QRS, right? But it, then you start counting one, two, three, four, five. There is no QRS here. So there's not five is to one, okay? And also if you see this QRS is coming right on top of the P wave. In other words, the P wave, the QRS is going in one particular head, the atrium is going at one particular head. ECG is capturing both together and putting a print out. That's all. So that's called an AV dissociation. So in other words, to say it's a complete heart block, there has to be AV dissociation. Is this a bit too much for you or are you okay? okay. <coughs> so first degree, second degree, third degree heart block. First and second degree, you don't have to worry. If you can have a complete heart block, it's dangerous. You know, sometimes you can go to sudden death. Patient can go to VF and all this stuff. So if you can identify complete heart block, mainly by this AV, there will be P waves will at different rate and and usually complete heart block heart, heart block will have radical. In first degree, you can have a normal heart rate, it can be 80, sometimes 100. Even second degree, sometimes you can get 70, 80. In complete heart block, always at this low. Because this ventricle doesn't have a capacity like a sinus beat to go at 70, go faster during exercise lower during sleep. It doesn't know anything. It just keeps beating, just to keep you alive, that's all. And that beat by nature is only usually around 30 or 40. So when you see a bradycardia like this, there is no AV association, it's complete heart block. In sinus bradycardia, usually you can get 30, 40 in sinus body, but there will be for every P wave, there'll be a QR. Okay. So when you see a heart rate of 35, it's either sinus bradycardia or complete heart block. For sinus radicardia, for every P wave, there will be a QRS and complete heart block, it won't be there. So that's how we have to distinguish it. It's important because sinus radicardia, patient may be very stable, even with a heart rate of 35 or 40. Complete heart block, they may need something to effect, pace my care and so on. <clears throat> then tachycardias, okay. So I don't want to show you all the pathway, what is the circuit and everything. <clears throat> See, tachycardia, you know sinus tachycardia, this is a normal fast beat. There is supraventricular tachycardia, there's atrial fractal, there's atrial fibrillation. These are the three you're going to see commonly. There are other things, you know, various junctional atrial tachycardia and so on, you don't have to remember. Supraventricular tachycardia is useful, again you'll see, I'm sure uh, you would have all seen SVT. Who all have seen SVT? Yeah. Yeah, you'll get young patients with palpitation, they come with a heartbeat. The key is usually the heart rate is around 160, 170. Sometimes 200, 220, and so on. In SVT, remember the heart rate is usually around 170 to 220, that range. Okay. And typically, you see the QRS is narrow. Now, this is like a normal sinus beat, right? Why is it not sinus tachycardia? Say, I would say this is sinus tachycardia. Tell me why it's not sinus tachycardia. Narrow flow. Yeah. 
Instagram. Yeah. 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 Where can you see the P waves? The P waves will be hidden usually. You won't be able to see it. I mean, here you see some P waves, but sometimes the P waves will be in, with, hidden within the QRS. It'll be after the QRS. That's called as a retrograde P wave. So, narrow complex tachycardia, heart rate around 170, 120. When there is no definite P wave, it's an SVP. Okay. As you know, some patients, I'm sure even ICU might have seen sinus tachycardia at 170, 180. Huh? Very septic patients, hypovolemic patients. Sometimes they can have a heart rate at 170, 180. Then you look at the P wave. If there's a clear P wave seen, it's sinus tachycardia. But there's no definite P waves, it's like, again, like the maybe dissociation of the AV and all those things. It's SVP. Okay. Yeah, the types of SVT, I don't think you need to know all that. Okay, this is a difficult one actually. It's a broad complex tachycardia. I'll show you. Yeah, okay. This is a nice one. Who can tell me the rhythm on this ECG? Is there sinus rhythm? Is this SVT? Is this sinus bradycardia? Is this sinus tachycardia? So what is this? Atrial fibrillation. Ah, atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Now you tell me why it is atrial fibrillation. You're right, but why do you say it's atrial? Irregular rhythm. Irregular. 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 Right? That's the main thing. See, QRS. If you see, it's irregular. These two are coming closer. These are wider. Closer, wider. So you get. And technically, we say varying RR intervals. These intervals are varying. Okay. So in normal terminology, it's an irregular rhythm. Okay, you can eyeball and you can say it's an irregular rhythm, right? To be very honest, even if you assume irregular rhythm is AF, you're not going to be wrong. Most of the time it is. Okay, sometimes you can have atrial ectopic, ventral ectopic. So first criteria you said is irregular rhythm. Number two? P-wave will be absent in that irregular rhythm. Yes, yeah, absent P-wave. You don't see definite P-waves, okay? Here you see, so this is called as an F-wave. It's actually called as a fibrillatory wave. You know, I told you the P-wave is what? Atrial activity, right? So the, when the atrium, rather than contracting like this, when it's just fibrillating like this, it generates these signals. Okay. So see, some are small, some are stronger. But mostly you'll get like a wavy line, like this only you'll get, usually. I'm sure you'll see it normally. See, this is slightly what we call as a coarse atrial fibrillation, or strong atrial fibrillation. You can see that. So in other words, normal AF ECG, you'll have an irregular rhythm and no P waves as you see. What you'll be seeing is something like this, like an F wave. Okay. So AF is very easy to identify, but sometimes like this one is difficult where it's fast. What is that? Um, this one. I mean, most people will say this is VT, but it's actually atrial fibrillation with abdomen conduction. I, I, I think that's a bit too complex for you. You don't need to know at this stage. Um, yeah, so this one. Again, this is not a... So what is this rhythm? Yeah. What do you say, it's, 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 is it regular or irregular? Regular somehow. Is it regular or irregular? Regular. Regular, right? Because you see, these two are closer than these two. Is it right? But your flutter is right, your answer is right. But can it be atrial fibrillation? Because where are the P waves? What are P waves? We have a lot of P waves, right? So all these are P's. But good thing if you look at it, unlike in AF, they all look the same. See, in AF, remember one P wave will be like small, one will be big, it'll be wavy. So they're all like dum 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 dum. It's going regularly. And if you look at the A P waves, they're regular also. If you mark this interval, it's all regular. So this is the atrial flutter. Okay. But you're right, normally atrial flutter will be regular. But this is something called atrial flutter with variable AV conduction. See, normally, atrial further, typically the atrial rate is 300. You can remember. So if you me measure the distance between this one, it's usually five small squares or one box, one big box. One big box is 300, okay? So typically, the atrial rate will be 300. And the ventricular rate can be vary. If two flutter waves, after every two flutter waves, you get one QRS, then the ventricular rate will be half. So flutter rate will be 300, ventricle can be 150. So the reason I'm saying is, remember, 
atrial flutter typically has two stone pillars. Okay, so if you see a tachycardia at the rate of 150, it's almost always see a regular narrow complex tachycardia with a heart rate of 150. It is atrial flutter unless coronary. Yeah, sinus tachycardia can be 150, but it will not be fixed. Sinus tachycardia, remember, it varies. When the patient moves, it will be 140. When the patient, you know, sleeps, it can go to 120. Whereas the atrial flutter is always 150, whatever the patient is doing. You shift the patient and move and do this and that is bang on 150 always. Okay. So regular tachycardia, <coughs> heart rate 150 is usually atrial flutter. But if you're lucky, you'll see these flutter waves. Now, sometimes the flutter waves may not be that mm -hmm. obvious. You know, it'll be very small. It may not be. Yeah, rarely you can get this flutter with variable conduction. Okay. Somebody has a problem with the AV node. It doesn't, by you know, by rule, conduct every yeah. second or every turn beat. It's uh, here. It allows three, four, five, six, seven flutter beats. I mean, there within four beats is conducting. So that is called as a atrial flutter with variable conduction. Okay, but otherwise, atrial flutter is usually a regular tachycardia, not a narrow complex tachycardia with a heart rate of one. When there is three to conduction, what will three to one conduction? What will be the rate in atrial? Flutter? So atrial flutter with 2 is to 1 conduction is 150. 3 is to 1 will be. What is the flutter rate? 300. 3 is to 1. Ventricular rate will be 100. Yeah. So when you see flutter with 150 heart rate, it's 2 is to 1 conduction. When there's 3 is to 1 conduction, you'll see the ventricular rate will be 100. When it's 4 is to 1 conduction, you'll see the ventricular rate will satisfy. So that is very typical of it. That is called as typical atrial flutter, where you have this fixed heart rate. This is a the atypical one, it's slightly, there's a variable AV block. So here you can see these are like flutter waves, can you see it's slightly different. So this is like 3 is to 1 conduction, isn't it? Can you see that? 1, 2, 3, 1. It can be 1, 2, 3, 1. So this is like atrial flutter with 3 is to 1 conduction. Even without counting, I know the heart rate will be 100 for this patient, okay? So you see narrow complex tachycardia, okay? Where there is SVT which as I said, it's a regular tachycardia, narrow complex tachycardia, heart rate between 170 to 220. Then you have atrial flutter, which is again a regular tachycardia, narrow complex tachycardia, but you see the flutter waves and the heart rate is usually 150. And then you have AF, which is an irregular tachycardia, the rate can be anything depending on the ventricular response. Okay, those are the three narrow complex tachycardia you need to remember. Now we're coming to the broad complex tachycardia, where the QRS duration is broad. Yeah, yeah, can you see that? So remember the normal ECG I showed, the QRS is narrow. You can see the QRS is broad, right? At your level, any broad complex tachycardia, you assume it's VT. Okay, it's always safer. But sometimes SVT can have broad complex also. Say if the patient has got a right bundle already, in the normal ECG, and they get SVT, they get a broad complex SVT. <coughs> or if they have left bundle underlying, they get an SVT, they get a SVT with left bundle, which but at your level, remember any broad complex tachycardia, once again the rate around 170 to 200 or 250. Sorry, assume it's VT, okay? But there is a difference between. Yeah, VF you know, it's just chaotic even if you don't get an effective QRS, it's all over the place, so that is ventricular fibrillation. But remember, commonest cause for this is the least moving, okay? I've seen all sort of things. I'm sure you guys must have seen all the patient, patient being dumped on his chest when they're sleeping because the lead was moving. <laughs> and people have given shock when the patient was awake, thinking it's weird. Actually, it was the lead was moving. So patients can actually sue you for that. You have to be careful. Giving electric shock on an awake patient or somebody with noise. It's very painful, by the way, electric shock. So always when you see that, first make sure the patient is awake. You know, the usual ALS thing. Shout, see the patient is conscious, and then you confirm it's a cardiac arrest, and then shock. If you don't see this rhythm, you just go and shock. Commonest cause for this is the lead moving. Okay, that's about the ECGs. Okay, um, uh... okay let's take some scenarios. It's always nice to discuss the patient scenarios. Okay, there's a 61, sorry, sorry 71 year old male comes with a typical history of angina. What is the typical history of angina? Mm -hmm. 
Is it all chest pain angina? No. No. So what is the typical angina? Left side. Sorry? Pain on the That is more unstable. And a typical angina is exertional chest pain. If somebody says, okay, if I walk from here to there, I'm going to get chest pain. I sit down, the pain disappears. That is typical angina. Okay? So typical angina is nothing but exertional symptom. Brought on by exertion, relieved by rest. Then you can get all these sweating, you can have nausea, you can get dizziness, and all these things. Breathlessness, all these are associated symptoms. But the typical angina is brought on by exertion and relieved by rest. So the 71 year old, typical angina pain for uh, for one hour. So this pain, you're right, sometimes angina can be addressed. In MI, in a severe situation, they'll be sitting down and they can get pain. Okay, so that is usually unstable angina or MI. Okay. So you have one hour duration of chest pain with breathlessness, he's hypertensive, he's taking aspirin and say I'm low to pain, and he's a smoker. So he's got all risk factors, isn't it? He's 70 plus, he's got the age, he's a smoker, He's hypertensive. Okay, so already the suspicion of cardiac thing is high in this patient. So now what you do, you do an ECG, right? Okay. Rather than going as group, we'll start with somebody. Yeah. Let's start with you. Just interpret this ECG. I told you the history, 71 year old. Are you in very ER or? Sorry? Oh, you're yeah, in the ward. Okay, say so some patient, your yeah, ward patient suddenly is having pain. You are planning to discharge him tonight. Suddenly he says he's getting some pain. And you do this ECG. The doctor over your phone says, do this ECG. So you do this ECG and what is the first thing you do? Okay, before that, interpret this ECG. Yeah. Don't worry, if you're wrong, that's absolutely fine. I mean, even sometimes we make mistakes in diagnosing ECG. Is it, okay, is it normal ECG or abnormal? Normal. Very good, that's a good start, okay. So now tell me what is the abnormality. ST segment elevation. Yeah, ST segment elevation. Okay. Anything else you can see? No. 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 So this is a QRS, a P wave, a P wave. You're right, ST elevation. Remember I told you the ST segment. S to the T wave. This is the ST segment, can you see? It's above the baseline. So this is ST elevation. This is the S wave. This is the T wave. So this is the ST segment, okay? It is elevated. There's some ST depression here, isn't it? Can you see that? Same ST segment. Here it is elevated. There is here it is down. See, this is your baseline, isn't it? It has come down almost 2 mm ST depression also. So you're right, that is ST elevation, 2, 3, AVF. You said a lot of ST depression. This is the AVF, V1, V2, V3, V6, V5. Everywhere there is ST depression. Everywhere. Apart from these, everywhere else is ST depression, isn't it? Why do you see that? Remember, I told you in ECG, V6 is opposite to V1. So in same way in the limb lead, in the leads also, there are some leads which are opposite to them. Inferior wall. Okay. So these are actually called as reciprocal changes, especially the one you see there. Okay. Sometimes you get when you see S2 elevation in some leads, you can see S2 depression in some leads. Okay, because the heart. See if your lead is like this, you're having heart attack in the front. It's the signal comes as an S2 elevation. If you have the lead is here with a heart attack in the front, it comes as an S2 depression. That's why this is, we call it as a posterior MI. Okay? So in inferior MI, you get this 2, 3 AVF. But in posterior MI, you'll get this ST depression because the wall is here, the ECG is here, right? Mm -hmm. The ST elevation is going that way. So on the opposite side, you get it as an ST depression. So this is actually an infra posterior. Mm -hmm. We call it as lateral extension. There is some lateral wall changes also. Or this could be reciprocal changes. So in, this is actually an infra posterior MI. It's a, it's a difficult one to interpret, but what I want you to pick up is these. Okay, so let's say there's an inferior MI. Now you were there last time, right? So let's see how we'll manage this patient now. So let's leave a what situation. This patient has come to the ER, one hour history of chest pain, ECG showing inferior MI. Who are the ER nurses? 
And uh, you guys are all very good. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you. But they're all okay. Why didn't you tell me? Okay, you are in the ER. You've done this ECG, somebody with chest pain. So what are you going to do? Were you there last time when I gave you the talk? Tell me. You were there, right? Now, what is the first thing you do for that, my patient? Oxygen is going on First thing is I attend to the patient's pain. I remember I told you when the pain comes anxiety as well. And these two in combination cause a lot of hemodynamic changes. Patient is tachycardic, sometimes the blood, you know, BP can drop because of that. In fact, see, as you know, when you're having an MI, the right coronary artery is occluded. This patient actually I know even without the angiogram, his right coronary artery is occluded. <coughs> With an occluded artery, you don't want the heart going faster. Okay. So there is no supply from the coronary artery, and the heart demand is also high, it's going faster, right? So that's why pain relief is important. So give them a of morphine or fentanyl. So when the pain comes down, the heart rate comes down, the patient is comfortable, okay? So pain relief is first. Okay. So first thing, give them, with oxygen, give them some morphine. You know, with morphine, always give some more magic. You'll get morphine with uh, Zofran or MSF. So you do that first. Okay, pain relief and uh, oxygen. And then? Nitroglycerin. Yeah, I told you last time. So what does nitrate do? Nitrate. The artery is blocked. You dilate the artery, what's going to happen? So it's not going to improve. When the artery is narrow, you give a nitrate, yes, it will widen, the flow will improve. If the artery is blocked, however wide, if you don't clear the blockage, where are you going to get the flow? So nitrate is useless in STEMI, remember that. Sometimes it causes a problem because it drops your BP and everything. For pulmonary edema, it does, it helps. Because it reduces the preload, as you know, in the lungs it reduces, it reduces the afterload, it does everything. In pulmonary edema, it's fine. In STEMI, you don't have to give a nitrate, it doesn't do anything, it only drops your blood pressure. So first thing you're antiplatelet. Mm -hmm. Remember last time I told you an acute MI is a platelet is a problem. Platelets are a culprit. Try to block them. Okay? Heparin doesn't work that much. Because it's not your anticoagulation pathway that is affected. So an acute MI is a platelet. That's why we always worried about antiplatelet. We give an aspirin, I give Carolinda. During BC also we give tyrofibrin. You heard about tyrofibrin, I talked to you about G to B3 inhibitors. It's all the platelets. And MI is a platelet is the problem. Unlike in PE or DVT is the coagulation factor. This is not platelet risk. Okay? So coronary thrombus is platelet risk. So whatever treatment we do is targeting these plates. So that's why you have to give aspirin. How much aspirin will you give? 300. Yeah, 300. With aspirin, what would you do? Drillinda. Drillinda, yeah. I told you the difference between Drillinda and Copidogrel last time, right? Drillinda, the onset of action is quick. Offset is act action is also quick if they need to go for surgery. It causes 90% platelet inhibition within two hours, whereas clopidogrel is hardly 50 to 60%. You know? So that is why we give Prilinda now. Moreover, for all ACA, not necessarily STEMI, even any STEMI. Okay? So Aspen 100, Tupacula 300, that's just Prilinda. Then what? 80, high dose. So these three are giving in here. Okay? So everybody is familiar with that. Then I told you about primary PCI, we talked about that, all those things I don't want to go through again. So the from your, at your level, remember, oxygen, pain relief, with uh, this thing, you can give some pan if you want, even if you miss it, it's not a problem. But aspirin, Brilenta, at all. Okay, just give it. I mean, ideally you need to inform us before that, but it doesn't matter, even if you give that and inform us, it is okay. But remember, the, I told you the timings, right, for the closed artery, we want to open the artery within 60 minutes, I think. So if they come to the cath lab, I want them on the cath lab table at least in half an hour. So it gives us 30 <coughs> minutes to get access, put a balloon and clear that right from the artery, okay? So your time, you only got 30 minutes to get them, the, remember that always. This is the door to the cath lab time. There are various times in acute time. There's door to needle time for thrombolysis. It should be less than 20 minutes, I think. There's door to balloon time for PCI, which should be less than 90 minutes. And there's door to cath lab time, which should be less than 30 minutes. Okay, so you need to remember. So these patients, after doing that, somehow, don't worry about preparation. I'm not going to shout at you because, because most of the time, we're going to use radius. So I will repeatedly say, don't 
waste your time on doing the preparation for our Peter Mahesh. Occasion is losing my card. Okay, <coughs> it does not have to work. I mean, we're not going to do open heart procedure or some major laparotomy for preparation. We don't care about preparation. <coughs> Just put the ship the patient, get the consent, all those things, and do that. So don't waste your time for acute MI. Primary, primary case here. Yeah. 99% we go through the radial anyway. And radial you can access without preparation. You don't have to shave. Groin, yes, maybe sometimes. So don't waste your time on preparation. Get them on the cat lab table for half an hour. So this is inferior mind. We are going to do primary PCI. Okay, that is straightforward. I think this patient has found wise. Next one, okay. 59 year old female, same thing, one hour chest pain, breathlessness, hypertension. She's also an asthmatic. Why is this history is important, asthmatic? Medicine, medicine. Yes. Certain drugs, you know, beta blockers, you have to be careful, right? Adenosin, if you have to use, you have to be careful. So that's why if the patient has asthma, remember, this patient, you have to be careful if you're going to use beta blockers. But anyway, you're not going to use beta blockers. I mean, we used to. So several years ago, an acute MI, just like your statin thing, first thing they give is IV at and okay? And because it brings the heart rate down, I told you, for that. But then we realized if you relieve the pain itself, it brings the heart rate down. Whereas giving ethanol it causes hypotension, pushes them into pulmonary demand, and all this stuff. So we don't use beta block anymore. But before discharge, we give them beta block anyway. So if you're asthmatic, you need to remember. He's already on a diuretic. Okay. Yeah, so that's when. So this is all the reasonable risk factors: hypertension, 59 year old. Not, I won't say a high risk patient, but typical chest pain. Let's see what the ECG looks like. Okay. So you got that. Let's go to the boys at the back. Interpret this ECG for me. First thing, normal or abnormal? If it's normal, I'm not going to show it. <laughs> so this is a 59 year old female, one hour is still chest pain. She's a hypertensive. You've done this ECG, you see this. What do you think? You will call a, call a cardiologist or you just wait or what do you do? Have you interpreted the ECG? Any abnormality you see? ST depression. Yeah, who all can see ST depression? Just be honest. If you don't see it, it's fine. Who all don't see ST depression? Just put your hand up. It's okay, just be honest. I can show you, that's fine. Who all can't see ST depression on this ECG? Everybody can see? Everybody's happy? You can see that, right? So here it's more pronounced. You can see just about one millimeter. <coughs> even there. Little bit here, but not much here. Here it's all in the baseline, the ST segment. Maybe a little bit here. It's more T wave inversion, I would say. So again, you got this two, three, you know, AVF, maybe four, five, six, ST segment depression, isn't it? So what are the possibilities now? 59 year old female, typical pain. She's coming with these ECG changes. Is this a STEMI? Will you call catalog now? Do we need to? No, Plan for primary PCI? Yeah, yeah. No, right? This is not STEMI. So STEMI treatment goes away. Now we're coming to the yes, other treatment, yes. ACS. Yeah, if you call it. So this patient could be ACS. She's got pain. She's got ECG changes. See, for, remember for MI, you need to have two out of three criteria. Legally, for any purpose, insurance, any purpose. Pain, ECG changes, cardiac model. Okay. You need at least two. If somebody has pain, but no ECG changes, a troponin is normal, it's not an MR. Okay? You've seen a lot of patients with troponin positive. I mean, I'm sure in ICU you've seen a lot of times, you know, sepsis patients. No chest pain, no ECG changes, not an MR. Even with whatever the troponin is. It could be due to sepsis, myocarditis, it could be various things. So positive troponin alone does not mean an MR. All that it says is there is some myocardial injury. That could be due to infection, inflammation, all the toxins during sepsis. Okay? So you need at least two out of three criteria. So this patient already has two criteria. So it could be an ACS or an MI, we don't know. When would you know if it's an MI? Okay, so so far, what are the possibilities? We ruled out STEMI, right? So this could be unstable angina, right? The patient is having pain at rest, he sees you. This could be an acute coronary syndrome. Other possibilities, it could be an end STEMI also. No, n is what? Nothing but a non ST elevation. That is, this is still an MI, but there is no ST elevation. It can have anything. It can have ST depression, 
It can have T wave inversion. It can even have normal ECGs. I'm sure you would have seen this in NSTEMI with normal ECGs. Some of these ECGs are completely normal. But they have pain and raised cardiac markers. So it is still an MI, but ECG is normal. So NSTEMI can have a normal ECG, remember. It doesn't always have to be ST depression. So these are the possibilities. This patient can have an unstable angina or an NSTEMI. So what do you do? How, what is the difference between the two? Are you okay with time? Cardiac insurance. Exactly, cardiac Now for this patient, you need to do that. Okay, so you don't have to rush in the cath lab. So the next thing you do is the cardiac model. So let's go through this, okay? So you send the cardiac markers. Now the results are waiting. Okay, what do you want to give from this list? <coughs> aspirin, who all will give aspirin to this patient? Yeah, because whether unstable angina or NSTEMI, you still need antiplatelets, right? They both need antiplatelets. So aspirin will give. Clopidogrel, now we're using ticagrel, uh, so you don't need clopidogrel. So you can, will you give Prilinta? Who all will give Prilinta to this patient? You can give, because ECG changes are there. So if this patient had chest pain with no ECG changes, and you send cardiac markers, you're waiting, I will not give Prilinta to this patient. Because what, I mean, this could be a gastric patient. Then he may bleed, right? He's got severe gastritis, peptic ulcer, doing brilliant. So if there's no ECG changes, try not to give brilliant. You can wait. It's not a problem. Waiting for the cardiac enzymes is not going to kill the patient when the ECG is not. Whereas if there's STEMI, you can lose the patient by waiting for the cardiac. So here, because you have two criteria, pain and ECG change, you can give brilliant. Or you can, even if you give clopidogrel, it's not a problem. That is your flavix and clopidogrel, these two. Anything else? Beta blockers? Remember this patient is an asthma. Asthma, yes, ah. Uh. So better not. I mean, his heart rate is okay, not that fast any. What is the heart rate? Uh, it's okay, 3, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 78, okay. <clears throat> so it's not that high, so you don't have to give beta blockers. Heparin? Would you give heparin or would you wait for the top two? Sorry? Who will all wait for the top two? So others are all happy to give heparin. I think I would agree with others. The same reason. This patient has got ECG changes. Mm -hmm. So even if the top T is negative, it doesn't matter. This patient at least has got unstable antenna. That means there is a plaque that is ruptured. There is a thrombus that is forming. Okay? That is in the process of forming. So heparin, this, you should give for these patients. When there is no ECG changes, once again, be careful. Maybe gastric heparin also can make it. When there is ECG changes with pain, ECG, provided is, say if I'm planning, this is like, Say two o'clock in the afternoon. This patient has come with those ECG changes. I see the patient, and I would say this patient needs an angio. Say top T is also positive. So we're applying for angio within the next one or two hours. Then it's better not to give flexane, right? So that is the only thing you need to remember before giving flexane. Is this patient going to have an angio now, or is it going to be 10 hours later? If the patient is planned for an angio immediately, if I've asked for the approval or whatever, don't give that. I mean, it's still okay because we give radial, go radial. In case we have to go femoral, the bleeding complications are high if they have flexing. Usually, after flexing, you need to wait for 10 hours. In those situations, use unfractionated heparin. That's not a problem. So if the patient is going to have an angio within the next few hours, say four hours or six hours, don't give flexing. Give heparin 5,000 units, not a problem. So that's how we're going to decide whether you're going to give flexing or heparin, based on the timing of the angio. This is not for you. I told you about tyrofagan and other things, right? I mean, we sometimes use it in CCU. So the patient has some reason, say, got renal problems. We can't take him to the uh, cath lab and do PCI. We can give all these powerful antiplatelets. At least I'm limiting the plot, you know, and stopping the progression to a stem. So some ACS patient, you can give tyrofagan or uh, integral and so on. Thrombolytics, will you give thrombolysis for this patient? Who will not give? Who will give thrombolysis? Okay, who will not give thrombolysis? Later. They don't know. We don't know whether to give or not. Right? Don't give them. I remember I told you thrombolysis. It's the elevation of much. So don't thrombolyze this patient. Again, bleeding risk. Nitrate. Who will give nitrate for this patient? With pain, ECG changes. Can give. Remember, it's tell me it's a total occlusion. Yeah, it's not a total occlusion. If it's total occlusion, the ST segment will be elevated, right? 
This patient probably has an 80% or 90% occlusion. Still, he has some flow. So, by giving nitrates, you can improve the flow. So, <coughs> nitrates, in ACS, nitrates are helpful. Okay, so, these are the things you, you got, and you have to, when you choose, you need to think. So, why are we giving acid? Why are we giving low monoclonal Why are we giving nitrates? Why do we have to get <coughs> beta blocker? If you think, then you know, you know what it is. But anyway, mostly, one of us is going to tell you about that anyway. So that patient had some sort of, I think we'll do this last case and we'll finish. 76 year old male, once again, see when patients in this age group, they come in with chest pain, it's cardiac, unless proven otherwise, okay? Don't send them home as gastric. And somebody is over 60 or 65, they come in with chest pain. Do not send them home as gastric, even if it sounds like a dead gastric pain. Always do an ECG cardiac troponin and rule out. Sometimes you may need an echo. Mm -hmm. By saying 76 itself, I know is at high risk of having an MI. Okay, so 76 year old male, pain is 30 minutes. Previous history of angina, he's got peripheral vascular disease. So he's got risk factor, smoker, I've tinted, I've, he's got everything. He's already on aspirin, calcium blocker, which is say I'm not a pin and a diuretic. Okay, so this is a patient with a lot of risk factors coming in half a half an hour history of pain. Ah, this is an ICCG. So who's going to interpret this one? Let's ask uh, you. Normal or abnormal? Normal. Good. You always get one point for that. And now, what is the abnormality? No, no, others don't say. Sorry. What is the abnormality? Deep, deep, deep. Sorry? Yeah. You can see, right, this area is abnormal, all these things. Yeah. Remember, in normal ECG, how do you get the T waves? Like this, isn't it? So where are the T waves down? And you can see it's right down. It's like going all the way to the ground. So these call it the deep T wave inversion. Okay. So what is this a feature of? Hypokalemia, what do you get in hypokalemia? You wait. What do you get in hypokalemia? Tall people. Tall people. Tall people. So that doesn't mean in hypokalemia you get T waves, no. Initially it's flattened. You get either flattened T waves or very small T. Sometimes you can get a U wave also. So hypokalemia, mostly you look for U wave. So this is not hypokalemia. This is again a feature of ischemia, isn't it? Remember, I told you ischemia feature is either ST depression or T wave inversion. Mm -hmm. Okay? But sometimes you can see this in acute MI also. In STEMI patients, say it's evolved, this is called as an evolved STEMI. The reason is this patient had, say, chest pain for a few days. At that time, the ST elevation is not being there. And then after a few days, the STs come to the, the baseline, but they get this Q waves. Can you see this? You see that? When is it called a Q wave? There is no R wave, isn't there? There's no R wave there. So this is a Q wave. So when you see this Q wave with this deep T wave inversion, this is more like an evolved stem. This chap probably had a stemmy two, three days ago. He's presenting now with this T wave inversion. It could still be an ACS also. It could still be an stemmy or I think this guy, because he's got Q waves, here he's got R wave. But here he's already got some Q waves. Okay, so this could be either an enstemy or an evolved stem. But the treatment, what do we do? I mean, otherwise, yeah, you've got some T wave inversion here, T wave inversion here. This is actually for us, we call it as an LAD syndrome. Okay, when you see an ECG like this, almost certainly it's LAD. That's probably typical ECG changes for a LAD lesion. Again, same list. What are we going to do? Same, no? Aspirin, maybe clopidogrel or the Gabrilinta. Beta blockers, you can, but heart rate is good, you don't have to. Same rule. If they go into the cath lab immediately, don't give flexane, give heparin. Otherwise, you give flexane. This may be in the cath lab. This is not a STEMI, so no thrombolysis. Nitrates, yes, maybe. Okay, once again, this is not a STEMI. So the treatment is more or less the same. Okay. But otherwise, the difference in the difference between an N STEMI and a STEMI is the ECG change, number one. Okay. And number two is STEMI has always had Occluded out under present occlusion. That's why we want to go and open it quickly. Time is muscle, you know. When the blood flow is abruptly cut down, myocardium, you lose myocardium every minute. Yes. So that's why. So in STEMI, always there is an occluded artery. 
have an ST elevation and time is a key. You need to give them half an hour, you have to get them to the cap time and open the heart. And instantly, even as 10% flow is good enough for the heart. When they're just lying down in bed, 10% flow is fine. So time is not an issue. So time is the main difference. So in NSTEMI, that is not always an acute artery. There's ST depression that can be T-wave inversely. ECG can be normal also, but always there is a raised troponin in ECG. Because of the myocardial infarction. Treatment-wise, only difference is STEMI primary PCI. And STEMI is like more organized. You can do an angular PCI. Drugs-wise, pretty much the same. Same antiplatelets, loading loss is the same, heparin is the same, everything is the same. It's only the time that matters between the two and the ECG. So that's why you need to, if you can in ER distinguish the difference between an STEMI and an NSTEMI, you're fine. And of course, a normal ECG from an ischemic ECG, that's all the important. You know? So you need to know whether somebody coming in chest pain is this ECG normal or abnormal. So that's why you need to identify the abnormal. Then for the arrhythmia patients, Tachycardia, you need to know is it SVT or is it AF because the treatment is different. What is the treatment for SVT? Yeah. You can give great blocking agents, right? High VIMS and no beta blockers, Verapamol, Dils and all the things you can do. Whereas in AF, it doesn't do anything. It only slows the rate, it doesn't cardio. Whereas in AF, you're more going into a spot or So that's why you need to distinguish these two. Of course, VT is different. VT is usually associated with the MI. So VT is an emergency. You can still give cord roll. But you need to get a cardio just quickly and act it to be a life threatening at the same time. Okay, any questions? You have to ask questions. If you don't have questions, either number one, you don't you didn't understand anything, or you know everything. 